Okay, hello, here again another Thursday for the seminars. Thank you for coming. Today we will have the PhD plans presentation. Um, the first one is going to be Anna, that she is a FAP, FAPI um, PhD student. <laughs> and uh, she will present uh, her thesis that is about demography and population dynamics of the Greek wolf in human dominated landscapes. And also, well, you are a PhD from here, from the EVD, but also the University of Sevilla, right? And uh, it's going to be 20 minutes talk and 10 minutes for the questions. I also going to ask for constructive questions, not really, really hard, and uh, just uh, something that is going to be <laughs> constructive for her, okay? So... Your time. Thank you. So, hi everyone, my name is Ana Morales, and today I'm going to talk about my thesis, which is entitled Demography and Population Dynamics of the Great Wolf in Human Dominated Landscapes. Let's start with a brief introduction. So, large carnivores are apex predators and keystone species, meaning that they are at the top of the food chain and they have a dominating influence on the composition of the community. However, they are one of the most vulnerable groups to anthropogenic activities, and this is because they show slow life histories, uh, low densities, large spatial requirements. Moreover, the presence across multi-use landscapes leads to several conflicts with human interests, such as, uh, for instance, the wolf um, livestock depredation and competition with hunters for game species. So, in order to build effective conservation plans, we need to fully understand their demography and population dynamics. For my thesis, I focus on the grey wolf. This carnivore species inhabits many landscapes across North America, Europe and Asia. Wolves form spatially and socially structured populations. They live in family groups, which generally consist of a breeding pair that monopolize reproduction and their offspring which often disperse at sexual maturity to form new groups or join existing groups. Wolves occasionally predate upon livestock, and this has historically created a negative perception of the species. And this is why wolves were steadily hunted, trapped and poisoned across centuries, until their eradication from most of their former range, only persisting in areas with low human accessibility. But fortunately, during the last decades, some populations are increasing due to changes in human density patterns and land cover. And this raises an important question, that is, what are the mechanisms behind and how do humans affect wolf demography and range dynamics? But two things make it difficult to answer this question. On one hand, the information on wolf demography is scattered and uh, disconnected across the literature, and on the other hand, the information is missing for many populations. So, in my thesis, I focus on these two aspects. Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 are two literature reviews across the distribution range of the species, 
one on reproduction and mortality and the other one on dispersal. And chapter three is about modeling the dynamics of the Iberian wolf population. In particular, to answer an important question in the Anthropocene, which is why do some species stay put despite an occupied suitable habitat and little movement barriers? So I will start with chapter two, chapter one and chapter two, which are entitled Patterns and Determinants of Reproduction and Mortality and of Dispersal in Grey Wolves. The first chapter is in preparation and the second chapter was already published in biological reviews. So as we all know, mortality and reproduction are both fitness components important critical for the viability of wildlife populations. And on the other hand, dispersal is a key ecological process that influences the dynamics of spatially and socially structured populations. For instance, through the maintenance of hem flow and recolonization of extinct habitat patches. However, the patterns and determinants of these processes are poorly known. Uh, in this, with these reviews, we aim to, answer, to identify the patterns and variability of these processes, the determinants of such variability, the method methodological issues that hamper a better knowledge and current research needs. And for that reviews, we located the studies in Elsevier's Scopus database. Regarding the, the review on mortality and reproduction, we extracted numerical information from 35 and 41 studies, and we extracted information on different parameters such as the ones we have here. We are currently reviewing the papers from the last three years, and uh, we have to organize the results obtained so far. So I don't have the results ready to, so, to discuss them today. However, I prepared this table where we see the minimum and maximum annual mortality rates per wolf status. And as expected, uh, pups and dispersers reach higher mortality rates than residents older than, older than one year, uh, 0 0.34 versus 0 0.49. Now I will talk about the results of the dispersal review. So we found information from 69 studies and we see that the information is biased because most of information comes from the US and Western Eurasia. This is the annual dispersal rate documented for different study areas. It goes from 0 to 0 0.79 wolves leaving the group per year However, comparisons between study areas should be carefully made because definitions of dispersal rates vary widely among different studies. We also found high variation on the length of dispersal. The net distance, so the, dis the straight line distance from the starting territory to the territory where the dispersal establishes or where it dies goes from nearly zero to more than 1,000 kilometers. The minimum distance, meaning taking into account wolf relocations, goes from 41 to almost 4,000 kilometers. And the duration of dispersal goes from two days to 38, day, to 38 months. Sorry. And the different colors uh, mean Different, the different outcomes of dispersal, so establishment or mortality, mortality, and different methodological issues that we found. Methodological issues are often related with the elusive nature of walls. For instance, uh, the length of dispersal, the estimates, are often biased towards short distant movements or monitoring of dispersal events is often incomplete. However, more important, we found that researchers often fail to provide detailed information on how they estimated the data. And this prevents other researchers from using the data. <coughs> we also extracted data on dispersal success. We knew the dispersal outcome from 70% of dispersal events per study. However, 
we didn't know the outcome for the remaining 30%. So there is a high uncertainty. And regarding dispersal events uh, with known outcome, 77% ended with settlement, whereas the remaining 23% ended with death. You might think that dispersal success is high. However, we expect a high proportion of dispersal events with unknown outcome cor to correspond with mortality events, in particular with poaching, which is really difficult to detect. So far, we've seen that methodological issues influence dispersal estimates, but besides that, many individual, social, and environmental factors influence dispersal. Here is a list with the factors from which we found information. However, I don't have time to go over all of them, so I will just highlight a couple. We found a nonlinear relationship between dispersal rate and wolf population density, being dispersal rate higher at lower and maximum densities and higher densities. And this, is, uh, this has been seen for other species and is consistent with theoretical predictions. So a balance between the benefits of cooperation and the cost of king competition and availability of uh, um, empty territories. So this balance changes along the gradient of population density determining dispersal rate. Human cost mortality can reduce the length and success of dispersal events through the direct killing of dispersers. Besides that, mortality of residents creates vacant territories and social openings in groups, and it seems plausible that dispersers attempt to occupy the nearby opportunities in preference to making longer dispersals. So human cost mortality of residents and dispersers can have substantial but differential effects on dispersal. Finally, we summarize the research needs to, to improve our understanding of dispersal. I will just highlight the creation of a global network database. So researchers should collect data on both dispersal parameters and the potential determinants and make such data available for future studies. And this will allow, uh, for instance, to do robust meta-analysis. I will start with chapter three, which is entitled Human-Induced Mortality Determines Range Dynamics in the Grey Wolf. I will talk a bit about the historical distribution of wolves in the Iberian Peninsula. So during the 19th century, wolves were <coughs> widely distributed through the peninsula. However, during the 20th century, the population declined, reaching its minimum by the 70s, when a hunting law changed the wolf status from vermin to game species. This, together with changes in human density patterns and land cover, allowed the population to initially increase. However, during the last 30 years, the distribution range and the number of groups have not changed substantially. And the different census done since the 90s gave around 300 packs distributed in the northwestern corner of the Iberian Peninsula. Moreover, a small population located in southern Spain disappeared recently, and wolves basically remain isolated from other wolf populations. Regarding wolf protection, wolves in Portugal were listed as protected since 1988, whereas wolves in Spain were legally hunted until 2021. So, considering the fast recovery of other wolf populations in Europe, the stability in the distribution range of Iberian wolves is striking, and it is also unexpected given the availability of suitable habitats outside their current range as previously seen by other studies. So our research questions are tightly linked to answer uh, why do some species stay put despite unsuitable, uh, unoccupied suitable habitats and little movement barriers. Most of the studies have only focus on, the, on how climate and habitat variables shape a species distribution range. However, several studies acknowledge 
that understanding the demography and demographic feedbacks is important to understand range dynamics. And this is uh, what our study is about. So we divided our questions in two blocks. In block one, we explored the demographic status of the population for the last 30 years of population stability by looking into parameters of reproduction, mortality, etc. And our specific questions are, has the demographic status of the population varied over time? How is the demographic status compared to other world populations? And in block two, we analyzed the effects of mortality. So if we reduce current mortality, what are the effects on the demographic status of the population? What levels of mortality allow for recolonization of suitable habitats outside the current range of the species? And do the mortality of residents and dispersers have differential effects on range dynamics, on wolf expansion? And to answer these questions, we build an spatial explicit individual based model for wolves in the Iberian Peninsula. Our model is made of four components, a map of habitat quality for wolves, the population of wolves that we use to start the simulations, the territory of the groups in the initial population, and the rules according to wolf ecology, which include detailed information on the life history processes that determine the fate of each individual each day, and the parameter samples that we use to fit the model. So a parameter sample is a combination of values of reproduction, mortality, etc. And we run the model each time with a different combination of, of uh, with, with a different parameter sample. And we also run replicates. When a variable, we use information from Iberian walls, and otherwise, we evaluated the range of values corresponding, corresponding to all uh, populations. And we did so by using the information collected in the literature reviews. So, after running the simulations, we compare our predictions with the real data to identify the parameter sample that best explain the past demographic status of the population during the three study periods considered. We selected the parameter sample that best explained the last period to do the future projections up to 2035 and under different scenarios of mortality. So, no changes in mortality and mortality reductions by 10, 20, 30 and 40%. Now, let's talk about the results. So, regarding the past demographic status of the population, I will show you several graphs where we see a metric, in this case, the mean annual population growth, and how this metric vary across the three study periods considered. In general, we found no substantial changes over time, so I will talk about the general trend. So, the annual population growth was always around zero, the proportion of groups breeding each year was less than 0.5. The dispersal length was really low. The median of the net dispersal distances was 31 kilometers, and the median of dispersal durations was 20 kilometers, with 20 days, sorry. The proportion of disperses in the population during breeding was 4% and the proportion of dispersers that died during dispersal was also low, around 10%. These metrics can be explained because annual mortality rates were high. So annual mortality rates for residents older than one year was between 0.23 and 0.30 and the annual mortality rates for pups and dispersers was higher, but uncertainty was also higher. Regarding mortality rates for dispersers, these are baseline values, meaning that they apply to dispersers that do not move farther from 100 square kilometers. So as they move farther, 
dispersal uh, mortality rate increases. And regarding the future demographic status of the population, I will just highlight our predictions of wealth distribution in 2035. So, if mortality rates do not change, wealth distribution regarding both the number of groups and the distribution range is similar to that in 2021. But if mortality rates are reduced by 10 or 20 percent, group presence increases mostly inside the distribution range. And if mortality is reduced by 30 and 40 percent, wolf expansion is with the spread across currently non-occupied areas. And we see that if we reduce current mortality by 40 percent, the net dispersal distances increase up to a median of 230 kilometers. What we have left is doing a sensitivity analysis to see the relative contribution of the mortality rates per wolf status on range dynamics. And as a general conclusion, we can say that, that wolves in the Iberian Peninsula have high mortality rates, and this leads to, back and ter to this creates vacant territories and social openings in groups, and so it leads to short dispersal events and a lack of range expansion. And moreover, our model show that wolf expansion can only occur if we reduce current human cost mortality levels. And a reduction by 30% will allow uh, uh, the population, the uh, wolf expansion, to increase in 2035. And this is all. I want to thank to my supervisors, Maria and Eloy, and collaborators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. It was really interesting. So now it's uh, allowed about seven minutes for questions. So anyone has a question? Thank you. Oh. Does it work? No. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So the demographic information, do you get it from the bibliography? Yes. I didn't get that. Yes, from the bibliography and when available, we use y data from Iberian goals, but it's also extracted from the uh, literature <laughs> reviews. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because the range for a single parameter might be very large, so what do you use, like the mean or the whole interval or no, how it so works? No, so we evaluate the whole range. Okay. So we create different, what I call parameter samples, so a different combination of values. So for instance, if mortality varies uh, a wide range, we sample the whole range. So we create different combination of values of mortality, reproduction, etc. We check like uh, 135 combinations, different combinations, so we are sampling the whole range to the test to identify what is the combination that is plausible for the, for the period of study. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. And uh, well, in the situation of the mortality, it's very confusing because you are talking about 30% mortality, but it's not homogeneous within Spain. In some areas was a game species, in other areas is protected. Most of the mortality is in uh, poaching. So basically you are assuming a constant mortality independently of the legal status, or do you think that that is an irrelevant factor? Just curious. For the past, um, if I understand well, for the past demographic status, we try to identify the mortality that was uh, plausible for that period. And then for the future projections, we reduce mortality based because uh, walls now are protected. So we expect that mortality decreases. That's our assumption. 
it's true that mortality is not homogeneous on, uh, on the landscape, so it would be great also for a future study. Yeah. Then that was the direction of my question. If it's possible to integrate yeah. somehow this het uh, yeah. spatial heterogeneity yeah. and how do, could that be done? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can do basically everything with this kind of model. So you can model uh, in a future study, for instance, if mortality is higher in some areas, how wolf expansion would be. And yeah, all of that can be, can be done because of course mortality is not homogeneous. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, may, maybe you mentioned that, but um, do you have also data for uh, females and males separately in terms of mortality? And related to that, also, there exists data on age at first reproduction, which is also a parameter that sometimes can affect these population models. Again, I, I don't know nothing about wolves, so uh, maybe this data is not relevant in your context. Yeah, so... The life history processes include all of that information. So we, uh, we have data not for the Iberian Peninsula, but for um, all populations, data on the, on the age at first reproduction, and is taken into account in the model. And so all that is known about walls, all demographic parameters that are known, are included in the model. So the life history process that I Previously shown here. Well, uh, you cannot see them, but <laughs> yeah. So each individual goes through each life history processes each day. And yeah, so in, for example, they go through reproduction, pub recruitment, etc. In in and in these processes, we consider all this data. So it's included. And again, if um, if for a parameter there is we don't know the exact exact uh, value or whatever we sample the range of values that is is in the in the literature. So yeah, in fact, uh, mm, creating all the life history processes is what takes most time. Okay, so we have one last question. One time for one last question, if anyone has it. Yeah? Thank you for a great talk. Um, that was very interesting. I was wondering, you mentioned at the end um, reducing mortality by 30-40%. Um, do you know how feasible that is? Do you know what sort of measurements or conservation actions need to be taken to be able to achieve that? Do you know if data is available on those type of on that, yeah, on, the, on that? I will say that it's pretty difficult that mortality is reduced by 40%, that's for sure. So this is just a, a model so, showing what would happen if you do that. But it's really difficult. Um, I hope, I expect and I hope that mortality is reduced because walls are now protected. Mm, now there is another deba debate if we, uh, I don't, from Europe that maybe they want to reduce their protection, but in any case, it's, yeah, it's difficult to reduce mortality and especially poaching. And we don't know the extent of poaching. It's really difficult to detect and yeah, so we should protect walls. That's my personal opinion because they yeah they are really valuable uh, they are really va valuable for uh, ecosystems per, but yeah thank you so this uh, yeah and now uh, we'll have another yeah thank you very much anna sorry <laughs>
um, won a FP, FPU fellowship and, and uh, with the University of Sevilla and the EVD. And uh, the, I, I, I think the, it's plastic as bio vectors, uh, no? Yeah, water vessels, plastic title. bio vectors. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I need the, the title, sorry. <laughs> and uh, again, uh, it will be like 20, mit 20 minutes for, for, for the seminar and then, yes, 10 minutes, a little bit less maybe for the questions. And thank you for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello everybody, I'm Julian. I've been here for, for one year uh, with, my F, uh, with an FPU, uh, supervised by Andy Rin and Marta Sanchez. And I'm going to show you my thesis plan that, I, uh, that is about the uh, water bears as plastic biovectors. First of all, uh, I want to give a little introduc introduction. Uh, as probably you know, uh, pollution is one of the main drivers of, of global change and specifically plastic pollution has received an amount of an, an increasing amount of attention than they are receiving. And there are more papers being published about the about this this issue. And well, to give some numbers, uh, in the world 400 uh, million tons were produced in 2022 and almost 59 million were produced just in, in Europe. Although I have mentioned that this is a very relevant issue in this moment, uh, most of the studies have focused only on marine environments, whereas wetlands or freshwater environments have been overlooked. Uh, although it is known that uh, the, F the effects could be similar or even worse in this type of, of ecosystems. More related with biota and specifically birds, that is the study species that I'm going to focus on, uh, most of the studies has also focused on the mechanical effects that can lead, for example, here to death by starvation, entanglement, etc. And recently there is an increase in the number of papers about uh, hormonal uh, problems uh, in tissues. But uh, we want to go a step forward and see uh, the role that, that these birds can play as biovector. This is transporting uh, these contaminants from one place where it is less co more concentrated to another where it is less concentrated. This is something that has, been, that has not been studied, uh, almost nothing. So this biovectoring has three st stages. Uh, first of all, and we are going to focus on on water birds, they have to collect this contaminant. In our case, uh, they collect mostly this uh, while they are foraging at landfills. As you probably know, mm, there are a lot of birds that in our days they are foraging at landfills more than in natural areas. And while they are eating uh, food, they can also acquire some plastic debris. So they collect those plastics there, then transport the <coughs> contaminant to natural areas where they usually roost and they can deposit those plastics by feces or pellets. Uh, you can see here some pellets with obvious plastic content that we have processed. And well, this is the, whole, the full framework of plastic movement that is made by, by birds, that would be biovectoring. So our species of study will be uh, the white stork, the yellow legged gull, and the lesser black backed gull, because well, they forage in landfills they also roost in wetlands, so we can have here the, the biovectoring role. And also, uh, for comparison, in one of the chapters, uh, they all three uh, are present in the Cadiz Bay. So we can compare uh, in the same area what kind of plastic they are transporting. The main uh, objective, as I mentioned before, is to study the role of water birds in the, in the plastic biovectoring towards wet wetlands. So we divided it in four chapters. First of all, uh, it was to develop a model that quantifies this plastic transported to a wetland from a landfill in, in the Cadiz Bay. Then in the ch second chapter, we would like to compare among different species, as I mentioned before. Then uh, we want to estimate that is the plastic that is transported by using nests, uh, because some species use also the plastics for the nest construction, uh, specifically the yellow lead gull. Mm. And we want to see how many plastic is being transported by that method. And finally, we want to find if there is 
relationships among the plastic content in the stock pellets depending on the foraging number of foraging trips to landfills and how many time they spend foraging at landfill and that kind of, of things. So our first chapter, the idea was, as I mentioned, to develop a, a model that quantifies this plastic transport to a complex of salt pond and marshes. Uh, for this, we divided it in three methods, the uh, three sub-objectives. The first, to quantify a plastic present in pellets, then estimate the number of stock that roost in that, in that wetland, and finally, estimate a, an amount of plastic that would be transported each day. So this chapter has already been published because this was part of my master thesis that in the first year we uh, worked more on it to finally publish. So we collected 42 pellets in a complex of salt pot and marshes in the Cadiz Bay and we uh, sieved them on a mesh of 0 0.5 millimeters. So we only are going to have plastics over that size and we discarded the smaller plastics because they are more difficult to, to analyze. And in quantity terms, these are more, more, more valuable. So we looked for plastics uh, using binocular loops and divided them in plastics or other type of anthropogenic material like glasses or, or metal. And we weighed each uh, kind of material for each pellet and finally corrected those weights of plastics by using FT. It's a technology that uh, can say if something is plastic or it is not and what kind of plastic it is. And we did this in the second and fourth chapter, so we are not going to repeat them. All the uh, pellets were sampled in the same way. And I have to say thank you a lot to Belen because she helped a lot in, in this process, uh, process of samples. <coughs> so continuing with the first chapter, we count with GPA's data from the stocks here in Doniana and also stocks from, from Germany that comes during their migration season. So you can see here that the movements between this complex of salt mountain marshes in the Cadiz Bay and this landfill are uh, very common each day. So we can see here that it could be a, pot be a, pot be a vector uh, potential role. We also have census in the landfill that were made by Paco Hortas and we corrected those census by using GPA's uh, technology. We also, once we have the data of those census, we made a lowest uh, estimation that it's a polynomial regression that gives more importance to those data that, that are closer to that uh, you are um, uh, calculating. So uh, we could have a value of birds estimated for each day. Each day. So uh, once we have a value of, of birds for, for each day and uh, the plastic content of the pellets, we developed this model that gives the total plastic deposited each day. It tries to, the meaning is that each bird that uh, stays, uh, that roosts that night in the wetland would adjust one pellet uh, with um, a, random pla a, random, oh, a random pellet with the plastic content that we have weighed before. So this is conservative because in the field, storks can adjust more than one pellet, but we, uh, especially male, but we stay uh, just with one. And we made this uh, 10,000 times because like these simulations to have a range of error. And some of the results, uh, we obtained that almost 100 kilograms of plastics were transported from the, so from the landfill to the, uh, to the complex of sand pond and marshes. Here in the first graph, you can see uh, the lowest estimations for the census uh, by a census and then the number of stock that are estimated to rest in that, in that wetland. And you can see that there are two waves that uh, overlaps with the migration pattern of these species. And obviously, as we develop this, uh, this model, uh, this is translated directly in the plastic transport that is uh, biovectored uh, to, the, to the wetland. So uh, we have here that there are two main waves of plastics deposition in, in the wetland due to the white stork. Uh, and this can be important because we can like focus our efforts in management during these seasons. Also, we have a heat map uh, that shows that plastic is not homogeneously distributed all over the, 
the, the area, but it is in <coughs> the areas where the stock uh, usually rest. Here, there is another graphic by using FT that says um, the percentage of plastic that we found in, in, this, in our pellets. Uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, and polystyrene are common plastics that are the, well, the most, the plastic that are more produced in the world, so it's understable what they are here. But it's, it's not disabled, this silicon here, because we didn't expect so much silicon in, in this white stock. Uh, the next question we have is, is biovectoring similar in all these species? And as I mentioned before, we want to focus not only in white stork, but also deer red gull and lesser black backed gull. Uh, and we can expect some differences because, for example, the white stork, maybe as it's a bigger uh, species, it's more, more plastic and makes and biovector more plastic by uh, per capita. And also, uh, there can be differences in the time that they spend uh, at landfills, and that could be uh, related with the plastic content of, of their pellets. So, the objective, uh, the main objective, was to compare the plastic transported by uh, quantifying the plastic presence in their pellets. Also, the total plastic that is biovectory to the Cadiz Bay uh, using similar models as we have seen before. Also, estimate differences in the plastic quantities and types, the, depending on the species, and try to find if any of these differences is also related with their movements, uh, where they forage more. So, for this, we have data uh, of the three species. We have some pellets. We have uh, GPS data from different areas of, of Europe. Um, we also count with census and well, we'll count with census data from Junta Andalucía in the natural park, so we can know how many individual, individuals are there. And here I plot a very preliminary movement map just to see a little bit their movements. Uh, these blue circles are the, the landfill, as three landfills. And well, we can see that they all move to the wetlands for, uh, for roosting and then. Uh, for the landfill for foraging, but uh, the, the green one, that is the yellow red gull, also goes a lot to ports and cities, that the other species doesn't seem to do that. Uh, we have some preliminary results, are very preliminary uh, at this stage. Um, we can see that the variation in the plastic content among the three species is very big. Um, we find uh, pellets without plastics and, for example, the pellet with more plastic is found in the yellow red gull. It was a pellet full of field plastics. Um, it seems that the white stork could um, move more plastic than the other two species, but we need a good analysis that is not done yet. We have just a preliminary GLM that I made, and it seems that the dry weight might be explaining most of, of the difference, the weight of, of the pellets. Um, we also, in this chapter, want to see differences in other characteristics in the colors of the plastics. Here you have a photo of, uh, we, because we made uh, photos for each of the, of the pellets, of the plastic in the pellets. We have uh, a photo of the plastic of one pellet and you can see the variety of colors. We can see, we want to see also differences in the characteristics, if they are pellets, if they are uh, fragments, if they are foam. And also differences in the in the type of polymer because, for example, we don't expand, expect in ghouls some such amount of silicon just by our experience processing the the pellets. But the FT for this uh, species is not is not done yet. So uh, this is important to know because this will make the difference in the impact to the ecosystems be because they can be easier to put to wreck, maybe easier to be eaten by other, other animals. So this is important to know. But plastic is not only in pellets. As I mentioned before, some of them use plastics for uh, nest construction. This is an example of a plastic film plastics. That's a globe in Odiel Marshes. This is a mayonnaise bag in, in Cadiz Bay. So. Our objective is to know how much plastic is transported just by the use of, uh, by the construction of nest, by quantifying, quantifying the presence of plastics in three different areas, estimating differences in the quantities and the type among these areas, and also um, trying to know 
how much is trans and finally, well, how much plastic is ends in the wetlands just by the use of, of nests. So we have a nest from three different locations. 30 nests are from Saina de Lodiel uh, in Huelva, 32 from Sainas de la Tapa in the Cadiz Bay, and 31 in Sainas de la Industria, also, also in Cadiz Bay. And we took photos of each of the nests that we collected uh, with the idea of um, to know if we could uh, estimate the plastic content of the nest just by looking to the surface, but it's something that we don't know still if it, that will work. So we also have GPS data for this Jerulet gull in the Odiel marshes uh, to know also if they move because we can expect that uh, by our experience Odiel ghouls maybe move more to marine environments and the others in the Cadiz Bay move more to cities, but it's something that we by the moment don't know with certainty. So here we have uh, how we collected the data. We collect those nests and we get them with, plast with the plastic content. And then manually, we search it for those uh, plastics. Um, as they are bigger, we can uh, select them in different categories, in hard, line, in film plastics, form, in silicon. And then we scan those plastics to have uh, photos of them, as you can see here. Finally, we made an FT uh, in the same way to know the nature, how much plastics are, um, are in this, uh, how much of those that we have separated are in reality plastics. So we then uh, collected the positions of 49 nests in Sainas de la Tapa because it's, it was the place where we can access easily with these GPAs from the last. And the idea is to um, I don't know if they, have, they can be seen well. The idea is to collect the position to know if the next year uh, the nests are repeated, uh, how many have been lost, how many nests are new in this area. So we made those in accessible uh, works. And we have some preliminary results that are not corrected by FT uh, by the moment. So we can change the, a, bit, a little bit the numbers. Here we have from the three areas it seems that in Sainas de la Industria there is a lot of plastic compared uh, to the other areas, especially uh, Sainas de la Odiel, but it still needs more, more analysis. Um, we also want to do a kind of uh, model to know the plastic that enters in the wetlands, but we're still thinking how to do that. We, this is just an idea. We want to count with the breeding pairs in the area, uh, also the plastic, uh, uh, the mean plastic weight of the nest of each of the areas and also uh, the percentage of new nests, how many nests are lost because usually these yellow lead gulls repeat the nest uh, year after year. So some can be lost and we want to see that. And where we this is a visual preliminary visualization of data, we can see that in ODL the plastic content seems to be less than in the other areas. But uh, the weight of the nest is more in Odiel than in, in La Industria and La Tapa, and we want to see if that is correlated, for example, with their movements or what they can use for, for nest constructions. Finally, we want to, s to know a, a, bit, a little bit more about the bigger picture. Uh, probably you know that Cosme recently here at DVD published a paper about um, the movement of the white stork from landfills to uh, well, how they connect to other areas. Um, here you have an example of that map that he, he produced. Uh, these in color are uh, different nodes. And there we can see that landfills play a very important role as connecting uh, ecosystems, so uh, different nodes. So using these nodes, we use, we like, selected some points to extract pellets from that uh, have connection with those landfills. Our objective, as I mentioned at the beginning of the speak, is to find relationships among the plastic content in the stork pellets and the foraging trip to landfills, how many time they spend there. For that, we want to also quantify and characterize plastics in the pellets from different areas that I'm going to show you. Try to find if there is any difference in those plastics in the pellets. And finally, find if there is any relationships on these differences and the type they in invest foraging at, at landfills.
So for that, we processes pellets from different areas of Andalusia. Uh, for example, Villa Raza, Vega Burguillos, uh, Marchena. Some of them are very close to landfills uh, with uh, less than three kilometers. And others are quite far away. For example, Matas Gordas and Desa de Abajo are far from those landfills. And we, don't, and we expect that they forage more on natural areas. So maybe they transport less plastics than, than the other species. And by the moment, that's everything. And thank you for all the people that I mentioned and I that have not mentioned too. And fine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julian. Now it's time for questions. We have 10 minutes because you're doing very fast. So, any question? Anyone wants to ask? Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you very much. It was a really interesting talk. And I just, uh, I sort of have a more biological question. So, for instance, all the plastic in the nests, what effect does it have on, on su nesting success or fledging success? Or is it, it, does it affect the stork in any way? Well, we don't really know what the effects. Uh, and there has studies, but not in, in gold nets, I think, more in stork nets. Uh, the mortality increases with the plastic contents, is that the mortality increases. And for example, when I was with the team that follows or ring the, the white stork, there was I have seen uh, some chicks that were dead because of those, those plastic, because they, they get uh, trapped on them. So, uh, yes, it seems that it could affect to, to their, their, their survival. But also, maybe there is other type of plastics, for example, the foam, that could help just by the heat that it conserves. Like, and but I don't know. We don't know exactly how can it how it can affect to to the population. So, are you studying it at all? Uh, not by the moment. Just uh, by working role. It's very interesting. Okay, thank you. I have one about um, um, when you said the the effort can be uh, the the effort to in the. Um, in the wetlands now that in the moment that there is a moment that there is more uh, plastic because it's yeah. related with uh, with the migration or yeah. the so in the in the thinking about how to do the effort no, in that uh, seasonal points do you think that is something human related that I guess it is not like the effort for us to try to clean it yeah or uh, the effort, what, what I was trying to say, and just not to be too long, was to uh, maybe there are like uh, methods to avoid the visits of birds to the landfills, like uh, ah. sounds or okay. or those kind of things, and maybe we, you, but it's not uh, so uh, useful by the moment. It doesn't seem to be very very useful, but. For example, falconry, uh, in the case of vogals, not in the case of storks, could be useful in those, in those moments. For example, and also if you can clean the areas where you, can, you see the birds are roosting, you can do the effort in, during those periods, maybe. In the other, it has less sense. Okay, mm -hmm. okay perfect. I didn't know anything no. about <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any question more? Maybe I can just add on that point. Of the falconry. Falconry. Yeah, but that's in the case of the goals. Yeah, yeah, but uh, since the question has been raised, it just would be interesting. Perhaps people might be in interested to know that. So, so it seems that the uh, Lars Fuscus use of uh, Antiquera landfill was reduced uh, by falconry effectively. Mm -hmm. But really, the goals just displaced to other landfills where there's no falconry going on even as far as Cordoba, and so the total amount of plastic brought by Laris Fuscus into Fuente de Piedra Lagoon has not been affected, we think, by the falconry, because it's only been in one landfill, when there's four landfills available.
So it's more like uh, I was thinking that all of these wetlands are actually salt pans. Yeah. So these plastics are going to a salt. And I was like, w like wondering what is the effect on the microplastics we're ingesting through th that salt, right? You mean that transport that this plastic can be in the salt later? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's something that we have thought about, but. The thing is that this salt comes from the ocean. So the ocean, as you probably know, is contaminated with plastics and microplastic and nanoplastic. So it has, we have, well, there are a lot of papers that uh, comments the amount of that, well, that salt uh, is contaminated by plastics worldwide. So we don't expect that these birds are having really an effect in the plastics or we cannot say by the moment that because we have not studied if those plastics really go later to the, to the salt. We know that they go to, those, to that wetland but uh, the thing is that plastic is everywhere, it's even in the air. So uh, I don't know if that the movement of the birds would mm, have really a uh, a translation in more contamination of the of those salts. Maybe we can if we could compare salts from different areas, but it's difficult because the the ocean and the sea where we extract the salt is already very contaminated. So it's not easy to and well they make the mountains of salt. <coughs> also, the wind with plastics uh, put the plastics on on those mountains. So it's not easy to to correlate that plastics are contaminating salt. There is now any question more? We can finish here. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you. Very you. Interesting. <laughs>